Now, I've been describing uh, the, relation, the intimate relationship between sex and violence within the chimpanzee social system. This lecture and forever after, we shift our focus to humans. And we want to ask what's stayed pretty much the same and what has changed. And today I'm going to discuss two topics. Uh, one, war and humans, which hasn't changed all that much, or you can certainly see a continuity. <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk about uh, fecundity in, in humans, how many children we bear compared to chimpanzees. And you'll see there's a very big difference uh, there. So uh, the most obvious similarity, the one that gets the public quite uh, excited, is the similarity in Oops, that was wrong. Come on. Oh, oh. There we go. Oh. Okay, so uh, violent death has always been a very important aspect uh, for humans, especially, well, all the time. But I'm going to talk now about what's called primitive times. And this is data from a tribe that's in Paraguay, in, in South America, in the period just before it had real contact with Western uh, uh, people. So it has nothing to do with, with, with modernity. This is apparently the way they lived for time immemorial. And what this table does is list the number of deaths by age, getting, putting them in different age groups. And here's just children, or we would call them infants almost, zero to three years. And you can notice there's a, a significant amount of death. This is all illnesses. That's communicable diseases and all kinds of other diseases. That's the percentage of deaths from that. And then there's other causes, uh, congenital, degenerative, accidents, some. But here's violence, various forms of violence. 56% of infants from 0 to 3 died because of violence. Here is uh, children, age 4 to 14. And again, we see that all illnesses, about 15%. Accidents, violence, 74% violence. Now adults, during this is a 45-year period. The, the, num the number of years in the periods are, are not equal. And here is illness, 28%, not insignificant. Accident, not insignificant. But the various forms of violent deaths, 46%. And it's only when you get over 60 years of age. So in each of those three age categories, violent deaths have been the dominant form of death. It's separated by males and females, males, females total. And that's true for males and, and for females. The, the sum, I'm showing you the sum totals. It's only even after age 60, violent death is still the dominant cause, a third of deaths. But it's the only age at which it doesn't really be 50, at least half the deaths, only when you get that old. So it's, it's quite striking uh, how significant uh, violent death is in human demography. And <coughs> several things should be noticed there, uh, that communicable diseases are less important for hunter-gatherers. These are very primitive hunter-gatherers, the Aceh. And one of your readings is, is from their own description of, of the way they live and the dangers that they face. Um, that communicable diseases are less important because the population density is so low. Later we'll see, and so diseases just don't get to pass around. We'll see later that the influence of disease rises uh, drastically, especially among infants when the population density gets high enough so that people pass around mm -hmm. diseases quite common. Another thing, you may notice from this that more individuals die in the first three years of infancy, 131 deaths, 
than in the 45 years of adulthood, 126 deaths. So deaths in infancy are 50 per year are 15 times as common as deaths uh, in, in adulthood. And of 383 people who are cataloged here, only seven people died of old age. All of them had uh, other really identifiable causes. So uh, given this background of the significance of violence, and this includes more than just war, uh, but does not include deaths from animals, being eaten by animals, which is an ac considered an accident. So um, uh, defining war, going back to as we talked a lot about chimp, what you might call chimp war, and now talk about human wars, let's take a definition of war as the intentional killing of members of one group by members of another group. And the killing is done because they are members of a group, not because of any prior or particular individ conflict between individuals. It's a group thing uh, that determines the, the two sides that they're going to kill each other. So the human social system in, in primitive times, and uh, in some politically correct circles, not supposed to use the word primitive, but I, I use it in its original sense of living closer to the way humans did million, thousands, many thousands or millions of years ago. It's an early, an early form of, of being human. So during that time, uh, we lived in small tribal groups, and they're multi-male groups. Again, we talked about most animals, solitary males, with strong male bonding, competition for status, lots of intergroup conflict, competition for females and violence against females. Everything that we know says that humans have, li have lived in, that, uh, in communities with those characteristics since as far back as, as, we, can, uh, as we know, and that is the same description you would put on chimpanzees. Uh, the archaeological data uh, shows that through early farming times, we lived in these small dispersed settlements, and the average size seemed to be in the same range as current chimpanzees about 40 individuals, size of communities range. But when you dig up these, the archaeologists dig up these old settlements, they're that ballpark. <coughs> uh, the anthropologists studying currently alive uh, people, again, find that the smallest organized group of humans is a politically autonomous group consisting of 20 to 50 individuals with a headman, headman. And they call this, the proper anthropological term is a band. And again, basically the same size as a chimp community. Among chimpanzees, as I've described to you, intergroup violence is a hit and run uh, affair. Uh, with small groups of, group of chimps from one community patrol their boundary, they detect uh, an isolated individual, a, a very small group, or even better, a single individual in another community, and then they attack. In, in, uh, Anthropologists tell us that primitive warfare has exactly the same uh, characteristics. Uh, among current primitive groups, uh, the commonest form of combat is called raids and ambushes, and communities are constantly engaging in this hit and run, these hit and run raids uh, on each other, and they spring ambushes to, uh, to catch lone members of the other group. Uh, I lived for a while among headhunters in Borneo. Presumably they weren't headhunters anymore at that time. And it was perfectly acceptable for them to go out and find a child from a neighboring community, same, same tribe, same everything, but the neighboring community playing by the river, catch him and take off his skull. And they had their attics were, were decorated with skulls. None of this was big, you know, that whole community fighting that whole community. But little raids, finding individuals, didn't matter child, adult, uh, n nothing uh, mattered like that. <coughs> so, uh, so you can draw many similarities between uh, the chimp organization of, of these, this lethal raiding and human warfare. And so how does one think about this? Well, there are two possibilities. Either whatever you think of the chimp warfare and the causes of it, you have to think that a lot of that is still causing human warfare, or you can say, as many uh, utopians do, that they're different, that no human, human warfare has nothing to do with chimp warfare. One of the ways to prove or disprove that 
uh, would be to look in history, as far as we can tell. And if it has different causes, what you have to assume is we know for sure that this is what chimps do. And we presume that their ancestors, some millions of years ago before we split, did that. But we don't really know that. Uh, but we presume it's true that chimps did, did that. And then sometime in human history, we have to find a period where we stopped doing it. And then at a later period, we started doing it again, but now for a totally different set of reasons than for the chimp reasons. So the strategy of trying to figure out this question is then to go back in history and gather the archaeological, the anthropological, whatever data we can <coughs> gather, and try to find out, has there been a period in human history where we were not, uh, did not have this intercommunal uh, violence? And the people who believe that war has different causes uh, is uh, they think it agriculture started because land becomes valuable or private property of some sort. People wanted to get each other's private property or governments, modern state governments, or very commonly you'll hear that it has something to do with modernity, that civilization has somehow corrupted the pure nature of early humans who were uh, wonderful uh, human beings and didn't go to war. So what was the, the situation for prehistoric humans? So we can go back to the Neanderthals, which are closest kind of sister subspecies. And these guys, as you know, heavy musculature, ro robust bones, they, they were strong, obviously strong characters. But when you, you study their graveyards, 40% of Neanderthal skeletons have head injuries. <coughs> and <laughs> how, how does one attribute that? Either they were very clumsy and accident prone and always somehow managed to fall on their head. You know. <laughs> as far as we know, they didn't climb trees very much and hang upside down and fall. Uh, or there was a lot of club wielding and head bashing going on. Homo sapiens, uh, not, not Neanderthals, the earliest human burials that uh, haven't just decayed away are about 20,000 to 35,000 years ago. And when you dig them up, what do you find? Spear points embedded in the bones, cranial fractures, scalping marks, and so forth. These burial grounds are found wherever archaeologists look. Uh, some of the most prominent ones are Italy, France, Egypt, Czechoslovakia, that, because that's where archaeologists have had access to dig. At a 13,000-year-old cemetery in Sudan, over 40% of the skeletons had spear or arrow points embedded uh, in them. The wounds, there were children buried there. The wounds found from the children in the, in the cemetery were all execution shots in the head or the neck. They were just bashed uh, to death uh, in the head or the, the neck. This was not like one burial from one horrific incident. It was clearly used over several generations. It was a continuing cemetery. And many of the adults show not only the wounds that caused their death, but many prior uh, wounds, bone cracks and skull cracks, that had healed. So you can see both a, a wound from some prior conflict which had healed and the new wound which caused the death at this moment. And individuals had gotten into a lot of conflict. One skeleton had 20 different wounds. That means bone cracks that you could still see uh, 13,000 years later. And soft into tissue. Soft tissue injury we just don't have any way of knowing about. When you get to modern times, uh, still prehistoric, I mean before we have any written records, <coughs> uh, before anything you'd call civilization, things get a little stylized, that, that clearly culture is advancing. There's a Middle Stone Age cave in Germany, uh, only five or 10, 000, five to 10,000 years old, where there are two caches of skulls, just the skulls are there. They're neatly arranged like eggs uh, in a basket. And they're the disembodied heads of men, uh, women, and children with multiple heads, uh, multiple holes knocked by axes into their skulls. And uh, I don't have, they didn't show a picture of that, but this is a modern version of this, actually from Thailand. This is the way skulls can get uh, arranged. This, this, that picture has a, a totally different uh, kind of purpose. Um, you, how many of you remember Iceman, the guy that got unfrozen from the Alps? You're all aware, aware of this. So in 1991, uh, <coughs> one of the glaciers in the Alps disgorged a Stone Age man 
who had died, they think, 5,300 years ago. And as at least a good number of you know, he had a lot of press and he was called the Iceman. Uh, and since it took 5,300 years for him to come down the mountain, he must have died pretty high up uh, in, in some high point of the pass in the mountain. So it was just assumed um, uh, that he died, uh, froze to death while trying to cross the Alps and uh, got encased in the ice and 55,000 years later uh, came down. So for 10 years, academic opinion uh, said that. And then they finally got, a, got around to uh, taking a CAT scan of the body. And guess what they found? A two centimeter flint arrowhead had ripped through his scapula and uh, lodged six centimeters deep uh, into his shoulder. He had been shot from behind by an arrow and he died of internal bleeding. Again, a violent death. <coughs> You come to even more recent times, uh, Native American settlement, American Indians, uh, from about 1325 A.D., so almost 200 years before their contact, to have any contact with, with Westerners. And this contains the remains of 500 men, women, and children. And this is kind of not a great picture, but again, uh, what, what you see that these victims had been scalped, mutilated, and then something a little unique, left exposed for a few months to scavengers before uh, being buried. Again, as a form of punishment, disrespect, or whatever, for the victim, you not only slaughter them, mutilate them, or maybe mutilate and then slaughter them, and then you leave the scavengers to, to chew on them, and then finally they get buried. In short, archaeology documents warfare in every well-studied region for the past 10,000 years, which is when we have very good records. Okay, so that's what you can dig up. The other thing is to look uh, at uh, currently primitive human beings and ask how many of them are truly uh, peaceful. And so the anthropologists now take over from the archaeologists. What the anthropologists find is that 90 to 95 percent of known societies have been involved in war that we can document. Of one sample of 50 societies, 45 engaged in war frequently. Four did not engage in war because they had recently been driven into isolated refuges uh, by warfare. I know if any of you have been to the, the uh, uh, Indians, the Amara Indians in Lake Titicaca in Peru? It's a big tourist spot. There's an island in the middle of Lake Titicaca, and they're very peaceful people. They live on reeds. They don't have anybody to fight. They were pushed off the mainland by war, and they've just been isolated. So that's one of the group that said, well, we haven't seen them get into any wars, but they have no possibility uh, of it. Uh, and one which is called peaceful, the Monachi, which live actually in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California, they say, well, we'll call them peaceful because they only rarely go to war. <laughs> Another study, 66% of primitive societies went to war every year, 75% at least every two years, and up to 90% went to war at least once every five years. So the evidence is, is mounting up that uh, so-called primitive humans are not a terribly peaceful lot. The Dani tribesmen of New Guinea had seven full battles and nine raids in one five and a half month period. You can tell some anthropologists were sitting there for five and a half months, and that's, that's the number uh, that he counted. One Yanomamo village, that's uh, in Venezuela, was raided 25 times in 15 months. In the US West, 86% 80, of the Indian tribes went raiding or had to resist raids at least once a year. Now you come to groups that are usually peaceful. So there's a group in Malaysia called the Semi, and they were recruited, so, but during World War II, as you know, the Japanese uh, took Malaysia, and the British incited uh, a sort of a guerrilla movement against the Japanese. So they were retained as scouts by the British uh, to, to fight. I'm, so, I'm sorry, this was later, this was, they, they were scouts to fight the guerrilla, and in, in guerrilla insurgency by, by supposed communists. But eventually, some of the guerrillas killed uh, a few of the semi, a few of their kinsmen. And then, even though they had never been known to be warlike, they became extremely warlike. One se semi-veteran recalled, we killed 
killed, killed. The Malays would rob the corpses, but we did not want anything. We thought only of killing. Wow, truly, we were drunk with blood. Sounds like that their culture, like many cultures, had repressed the killing for some instinct or killing propensity for, for one reason or another. And then when the cultural controls came off, boom, the, the, the instinct just roars up totally full-blown, almost instantaneously. And we've seen that in, in so many cases. In Yugoslavia recently, where people lived together for a very long time in moderate harmony, uh, all of a sudden, bang, they start killing each other. Uh, the Germans in the 19, before the Depression, the 1920s, were among the most civilized people on earth in science and education. Boom, they become savages almost uh, Im immediately. So I think the indication is there's something inside of us ready to pop out. Culture can repress it, but demagogues know how to stick their finger into populations and pull out that us-them and vilify the them and bring us right back to chimpanzee days. Uh, you all know Yale is a center for study of the Cambodian genocide, where now one group of, of people, the Cambodians, sort of split into two, and the, the slaughter was, was terrible. How, how, have you how many of you seen the movie The Killing Fields? How many of you know about the Cambodian genocide? Again, most of you, but not, not all of you. It's one of the most recent, most horrific uh, kinds of killing. And the, this killing is, can be, what basically happens is that one group does not consider another group humans. And if you look in primitive languages, very often the word for human is the same as the word for their group, whatever their group is. And in the American Indians, that was also a, a common uh, kind of phenomenon. There's a good report from March 18th, 1690, uh, in Salmon Falls, New Hampshire where a girl named Mercy Short lived. They were raided by the Abenaki Indians. That was at that time, 69, of course, a real frontier town. Mercy saw them kill her parents and three of her brothers and sisters. She was taken to, on a long winter march to Canada. The captors sort of dragged her up to Canada. During that march, she saw a five-year-old boy chopped to bits, a young girl scalped, and was forced to watch with her hands tied as another fellow captive was stripped, bound to a stake, and tortured with fire, after which the Abenaki danced about him, and at every term, turn they did with their knives cut collops of his flesh from his naked limbs and throw them with his blood into his face. Remember, this is someone who's already a captive with the hands tied, so there's no immediate threat. It's a, it's a clear sign of just not considering these outgroup individuals as humans. The all group chimpanzees have one, s one set of morals toward an in, in, in group, and as, a, as I've told you, that in the wild, the male male conflicts never result in death, nor do the male female conflicts within a group. Uh, but in an outgroup, if possible, they always result in death. <coughs> now, what does one, one think of, that, of this? There's a very interesting story. Uh, from early uh, America is actually Americo Vespucci, after whom America I is named. And you know Columbus discovered America in 1492. Ten years later, uh, they were exploring all around, and Vespucci went on a, one of the exploration expeditions along the coast of South America. And he had uh, some interaction with the local tribes people and had some interpreters on board. Columbus had brought some natives back to uh, Europe and they were able to do some kind of translation. And he was very interested that how different they were from Europeans. Their marriages are not with one woman, but with as many as they like, and without much ceremony, meaning they just get married very casually. And we have known someone who had 10 women who married to him. They are very prolific people, meaning having lo lots of children, but they have no heirs because they hold no property. Even childbirth is without pain. Quote, women in parturition do not use any ceremony as ours do. They eat everything, go on the same day to the fields, and wash themselves. It seems that they hardly feel their parturition. 
parturition, uh, giving, giving birth. Now you can see that what he's dealing with is the 1500s, the, the late Renaissance attitude, political science theory. What is it that causes wars between societies, which they had lots of back then? And one of the uh, issues is original sin. These are very uh, religious people. And uh, what was the, the major punishment for uh, Eve's eating of the apple? Pain in childbirth, severe pain in childbirth. Here were some people that had no pain in childbirth, and he, he waxes poetic about that. Were they absolved of original sin? Uh, that's the kind of issue that, that's in, in his mind. He also says, they are people who lived many years, and according to their succession, we have known many men who have four generations living. So that's about 80 years. What is he referring to here? Again, from the Bible. This, the span of life. What's the span of life? 70 years. Very hard to fit four generations into that. So again, he's reflecting that this, these are not people uh, like European people. So he goes on with all the wonders of their civilization, or their uncivilization, whatever you want to call it. But, he says, quote, they are a warlike people, and when they fight, they do so very cruelly. And that side, which is lord of the battlefield, bury their own dead, but the enemy dead they cut up and eat. One of their men confessed to me that he had eaten the flesh of more than 200 bodies. Continuing, Vespucci talking. The most astonishing thing about their wars and cruelty is that we could find no reason for them, since they have no property or lords or kings or desire for plunder or lust to rule, which seems to me to be the causes of war and disorder. Again, straight late Renaissance theory of political science theory. When we ask them to tell us the cause of the war and disorder, they could give no other reason except that this war began among them a long time ago, and they wished to avenge the death of their ancestors." So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, passage. Um, the Indians, you know, Vespucci's idea is that original sin is what causes this, and then political, the, the, the sins that humans do have, the, the lust for power, et cetera, is what causes uh, all these wars, and none of that fits uh, these South American Indians. Uh, the same message that the it's not obvious what the cause of these wars is comes from modern anthropology. So you know the Yanomamo of Venezuela and Brazil who are very violent people. They, there was a book called The Fierce, what is it, The Fierce People that describes them. They're, they're very, very warlike. They're in that border between Venezuela and Brazil. <coughs> they're involved in almost constant warfare and yet, what are they after? Yanomomo villages are surrounded by abundant, unoccupied territory. They're just not settlement to settlement to settlement. There's, there's plenty of space in which uh, they could expand. Napoleon Chagnon, who you may have heard of, the anthropologist who studies uh, the Yanomomo, believes that the fighting between them was apparently motivated only by desires to exact revenge and capture women. We've seemed to have come across this before. But again, just as in, within, as in chimpanzees, in primitive warfare, females are killed as often as they are captured. Uh, and most of these primitive tribes, as well as modern peoples, have difficulty uh, getting food, not as a cause of war, but as a result of war. Things get so disrupted by war that that's the reason they have trouble getting food. Okay, all of this is archeological and anthropological, studying times or peoples who don't have really any writing system. So in, in a sense, it's prehistoric. Once we come to writing, uh, the, record, the, the record of violence flows hot and heavy. Uh, the first account of the exploits of mortals are, are military histories. The earliest writing of the Chinese, of the Greeks, of the Romans are concerned with wars and warrior kings. The most Ma Mayan hieroglyphic texts are, are devoted to the genealogies, biographies, and military exploits of, of the Mayan kings. Uh, the earliest Egyptian hieroglyphics record the victories of Egypt's first pharaohs. Uh, the first uh, 
secular literature written in cuneiform recounts the adventures of the warrior king, uh, Gilgamesh. The early and extreme warlikeness of the earliest civilizations is laid out in the Bible. You just read the Bible and you get the whole message I, I'm giving you. Uh, the earliest uh, written part of the Old Testament, uh, re re Exodus, recounts the brutal Hebrew conquest uh, of, of Canaan. So Numbers uh, 31, 7 to 18. Uh, the Israelites get the Ten Commandments, uh, thou shalt not kill, and then they go off to conquer Canaan with, with lots and lots, lots of killing. Uh, they wage war against the Midianites, as the Lord, this is one of my favorite passages, uh, they wage war against the Midianites as the Lord had commanded Moses and killed every male among them. But the Israelites kept the women of the Midianites with their children as captives. When Moses learned about this, the captains came back, you know, thumped their chests, we've had a great victory, we've killed all the men, and here we have the women and children as captives. Moses becomes angry. So, you have spared all the women. Why, they are the very ones who prompted the unfaithfulness of the Israelites toward the Lord. Slay, therefore, every male child and every woman who has had intercourse with a man. But you may spare and keep for yourselves all girls who have had no intercourse with a man. An echo of the chimpanzees who, when a female tries to transfer, if she has children, she's a goner. If she's young, presumably a virgin, then uh, she will probably be allowed to transfer. After the fall of Jericho, the Israelites, quote, put to the sword all living creatures of the city, men, women, young and old, as well as oxen, sheep, and asses. Next they attacked uh, Ai. There fell that day a total of 12,000 men and women, the entire population of Ai. So the, the clear thing, it's quite striking how this comes so soon after the Ten Commandments that what's clearly going on is just as in Shams, there's an in-group, and clearly the Ten Commandments is made, intended for the in-group, thou shalt not kill, straight chimpanzee. However, out-groups, <laughs> if you don't kill them all, you're, you're, you're not obeying uh, God's uh, commandments. So, <coughs> in very modern times, uh, atrocities continue with no lessening of, of, the, of, of the horrific nature of it uh, compared to chimps or early human beings. And I'll describe one, of, one famous event to you, which, how, how many of you know about the rape of Nanking? Again, not all of you. All of you should know these things that I refer to are very important things. Uh, this is during World War II, in, uh, I think it was 1937, <coughs> the Japanese were trying to conquer China, and it was a big place, and they were getting rather frustrated because you know, Japan is a small place and China is a huge place, and it's not an easy thing to do. But they, they captured a city called uh, Nanking, in the south of the Yangtze River. In short order, the Japanese slaughtered 350,000 people. The total population of Nanking at the time was only about 650,000, and several hundred thousand had already fled. In short, they basically killed every Chinese that they could find, just like the Bible stories, or the chimpanzee stories. A Japanese newspaper reporter watched Chinese prisoners being bayoneted on the top of the city wall. One by one, the prisoners fell down into the, to the outside of the wall. Blood spattered everywhere. The chilling atmosphere made one's hair stand on end and limbs tremble with fear. So this report is, is talking only from Japanese and we'll see na Nazi sources because the possibility that Chinese sources may be exaggerating or something, but the, the belief is that neither the Japanese nor the Nazi sources would exaggerate. Another Japanese military correspondent, even more constrained, described another locale where the murders were by samurai-style decapitations. Those in the second row were forced to dump the severed bodies into the river before they themselves were beheaded. The killing went on nonstop from morning until night, but they were only able to kill 2,000 persons that way. The next day, tired of killing in this fashion, they set up machine guns. So great was the slaughter that the Japanese general complained that he could not find ditches deep enough to bury the enormous pile of corpses. Tens of thousands of Chinese women were raped, often in schools and nunneries. Thousands more were put into sexual slavery, forced into prostitution, 
whom they refer to in Japanese as public toilets, the, the women forced into prostitutions. Many soldiers went beyond rape to disembowel women, slice off their breasts, nail them alive to walls. Fathers were forced to rape their daughters and sons their mothers. Not only did live burials, castration, and the carving of organs and roasting of people become routine, but more diabolical tortures were practiced, like hanging people from their tongues on iron hooks, or burying people to their waists and watch them being, a tor and watch them being torn apart by German shepherds. So sickening was the spectacle that even the Nazis uh, in the city were horrified. When the Japanese took Singapore right after Pearl Harbor, they shot and decapitated another 20,000 uh, Chinese. So that was just a, a, a modern example to show you that whatever this is in humans that makes us want to kill members of another group, it is totally unfettered by anything that you might call uh, control or, or civilization. When it breaks out, the violence is, is just incredible. So the bottom line is that war seems to be characteristic of almost all and, and possibly all human societies at all times in our history. There is no example, no, no period which we can find out where there's a discontinuity between the chimpanzee behavior and our current behavior. And so again, I think whatever um, you think uh, of what's causing the chimpanzee war, you probably have to consider very much the same explanation for, for human war. The amount of death, I showed you one uh, example from one tribe, the Aceh in South America, and any one tribe uh, experience may or may not be characteristic. This is from a book, uh, Lawrence Keeley, uh, War Before Civilization, which traces a lot of the information I've been giving you. And what he does is he he collects all the data that anybody has ever captured, not just that, that are sort of he can get some idea of the percentages of deaths uh, by war. And this is percent of deaths from warfare. This is males, uh, and this is everybody together. So and these are different tribes at different times for whom we have data. And you'll see that the numbers, the male numbers, go up to 50 or 60 percent of male deaths are from these wars, and the deaths of everybody which is, which is this, is somewhat smaller, uh, a fifth or a sixth, 15 to 20 percent of deaths, but going up, of course, to, f to uh, 40 percent of deaths. So <coughs> what the point he's trying to make with this graph is, here's primitive warfare, these uh, darkly colored bands, what he calls uh, primitive warfare, and the white bands uh, are uh, so-called civilizations, and he calls civilization anything that has a state, like the Aztecs had a state, and one of these is Aztecs. <coughs> and from the data that one has, we are, even though we think of World War II and all these current incredible wars and all our technology devoted to war, what's happening is that we have much more, many, many more people die than did in the past, but the population of humans has grown so much that the percentage uh, is not so huge, and our wars are less frequent. Rather than having raids almost continuously, as in a lot of primitive warfare, we have wars every 15 uh, or, or 20 years or so in, ge in general between any, any two groups uh, fighting each other. So what he shows, again, from the data that one has, which has large and unknown error bars, the civilized warfare, which is the Aztecs, uh, uh, France in the 19th century with the Napoleonic Wars and the 1870 war, uh, Western Europe in the 17th century, lots and lots of wars in the 1600s, uh, U.S. and Europe in the 20th century, World War I, World War II, and so forth, that as far as he can tell, the fraction of, of all deaths that's that is caused by war is decreasing. And one possible very nice way of looking at, at human history is that uh, humans have some sort of a propensity, call it an instinct, if you like, uh, to identify an in-group and everyone else's out-groups. These in-groups can be nationality, they can be religion, they can be color of skin, they can be language. Language is a big source of conflict in Canada and Belgium, all, all kinds of places. Uh, almost anything will, will do. It can be Yale versus Harvard or Berkeley College versus Calhoun College. Uh, 
and you know, Red Sox, you know, people with Red Sox fan. The English, who are generally very civilized, get into a soccer stadium and they start killing each other. So humans have this enormous desire to identify in group and out group. And you know, we even now pay you know, you to advertise a company because anything that looks like a group membership symbol, humans love that and will pay a lot to have you know, a, a hat or a, 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 a name of uh, some team or even some company on them. And we have very different morals toward the in-group uh, and, and, and the out-group. And uh, it seems that that's what's still, still going on uh, to us, that as uh, we have that still, but as time goes on, because of increased communication and increased education, probably the, what we consider the in-group grows. First it was your little village, of, you know, little hamlet of 40 people. Then maybe you organize into some sort of a tribe of a thousand people. And gradually it grows. You, if you read the history of Europe, uh, there are all these little cities, uh, say Greece, with city-states. A whole city could consider one family, with a lot of uh, divisions within it. Uh, Renaissance Italy, you have uh, the Medici's and the Pazzi killing each other, families w within cities. But gradually it grows. You get nation-states, and as they grow, the wars get less because people within, say, France don't generally have wars with each other, but France will have a huge war with Germany. So the group that people consider us gets larger, the frequency of war goes down, but since you have so many people fighting so many people, the war causes more and more deaths. And possibly, this is optimistic, that as we become more interconnected and we consider more people us and fewer people them, that gradually this behavior will uh, disappear. But that's just guesswork. Okay. Um, <coughs> now Keeley, who gathered a lot of this data, he has his own summary. And again, in frustration about not really understanding other than what these wars are all about, he does not accept any idea that there's any biology involved. He says, he says since he can occasionally find some group that hasn't been to war for 20 years or something like that, then it can't be biology. And the view of biology that many social scientists have is sort of that everything is, in, if it's biology, it's a knee-jerk knee reflex. You know, if, you're not, if your ner nervous system is not impaired, every time I, I hit your knee with a hammer, your, your knee will kick out and there's no volition. And they say, so if we ever see an, an ex a human not doing some behavior, that behavior cannot be instinctual. Of course, that was disproven uh, in around 1910 by Pavlov. You all know about Pavlov? So he takes an instinct as basic as eating, and a dog sees a piece of meat and starts salivating. And then very rapidly he rings a bell a minute before uh, the dog sees the meat, and the dog starts salivating to the bell. So since 1910, at least, we've known that even the most basic behavior uh, can, uh, can, be con uh, can be controlled by something with a smaller, smaller brain as a dog even though one would never say the dog does not have an eating instinct, does not have a salivating instinct. Of course they do, and yet dogs can control it. I tell a story <coughs> about my dog, so a, 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 a smallish white Samoyed. And I'm at work all day, I work long hours, and so she's at home all day, and you know, by the time I come home, she's a little frustrated. You know, she's been cooped up, and I'm a little frustrated. So you know, what happens, I get down on my hands and knees, and I growl at her. She immediately picks up the cue. She's snarling back at me, and then I, I swat her one, you know, gentle swat, but she gets, she snips back at my hand, and we go at it. We have a great time. <laughs> Unfortunately, my dog has died, but we, have, we had a great time, uh, and in the course of these, you know, she's snapping, and she's aroused. Uh, her hair is standing on end, her tail is straight up, her fangs are, are, are showed, and she's, she's snapping away at me, and I get maybe um, fifty, we do 20 minutes or so, uh, maybe at least 50 to 100, you know, bites where she actually, she wins. I, I win, I smack her, she wins. Uh, and but what, so that means over the years, I've had oh, many tens of thousands of times where she's, you know, grabbed me and all that. And guess what? Not once in all those many thousands of bites has she ever pierced my skin. All right. This is a peaceful house dog. She doesn't know anything about killing. No, not true. In the morning, I take her out running in the woods. I, I know that she takes me or I take her. And 
if she sees a bird or a squirrel, she's off. And she comes back with a dead, dead bird in, in her mouth, clearly killed. She clearly bit through their skin, you know, very, very proud, walking there with a dead squirrel. So here's an animal, and I love her dearly, but her brain was, is not very big. And she can get into the, the depths of really instinctual responses, and yet her brain is clever enough to be able uh, to control it and, not, and to kill the squirrel, but not to kill me, or not to even break through my skin. <coughs> So I think the idea is, a lot of people think when you describe uh, a biological basis for a behavior that it's inevitable, and the human species are lost, we're never going to change, but that's, that's nonsense. Humans are, like chimpanzees, are quite intelligent, and we are capable, we have instincts, I believe that we have instincts for sure, you see it come out in the most horrible ways and in some of the good ways, uh, but it's not that difficult uh, to control. My dog can do it, you guys can do it. <laughs> the other issue, which, and, and these are good topics for discussion in the sections, is some people also say when I describe like uh, ducks rape or orangutans rape, that somehow by describing it and, and saying that animals do it, I'm justifying it, you know. And there's this whole thing now that what's natural is good, and what animals do is natural, and therefore it's good, and this slops over into foods and everything. But, uh, this whole idea of natural law uh, that, that you can tell from nature what, what is good and what is bad is, 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 is not to be taken seriously. Okay, that set finishes that topic, and I think you've had enough violence. I want to skip, uh, switch to the opposite side now. Demography is, of course, births and deaths. That, those are the two main things in demography. And we've been talking about one of the main causes of human death on one side, and we find that there is a clear continuity between chimpanzees uh, and humans. Now let's talk about the other side, births, and there, surprisingly, humans are drastically different from chimpanzees. And so how do we know this? Well, chimpanzees were never very successful demographically. Uh, at their peak, there may have been two million chimpanzees. Uh, a very small Chinese city is two million in individuals. Um, and now, uh, because of the rise of humans, they're taking over their territory. They, the guess is they've been reduced to about 100,000, uh, 5% of, of their peak population. They're restricted to Central Africa. They have never spread uh, beyond Central Africa. Humans, on the other hand, as you know, number in the billions. We spread to the farthest corners of the Earth, from uh, the ice cap around the North Pole to the hottest desert and, and, and jungle. Um, there are 10, 000, tens of thousands of times as many people, humans, as there are chimpanzees. And humans have become absolutely dominant basically everywhere on Earth. So from a demographic point of view, uh, the, maybe the first question we should ask, why are there so many humans and so few chimps? What is the secret of our demographic uh, success? Let me give you a clue about uh, the time scale. Uh, we separated uh, from chimps about six million years ago. And I've shown you, oh, this is another version of the deaths. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, remember this, this uh, the family tree here. And here is the split point where humans branched off from chimps and bonobos, and it's ballpark six million years ago uh, that we split off. <coughs> the population size, what is believed, uh, that the population size uh, of, the, all of uh, the, 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 the group that became these three species was only about 50,000 individuals at this split point. That comes from the uh, genetics. The, the variation in genetics. <coughs> and uh, this, a small group branched off and started behaving, evolving quite differently. Uh, so what happens when you have a, a, a small group to begin with, of 50,000 breeding individuals, and then a small group breaks off, and they may further subdivide into small groups that may not come much in contact with each other, you have inbreeding. And inbreeding, uh, cause a lot of genetic problems, it also allows evolution to, to 
go very rapidly. If a mutation that is beneficial appears, it can spread to a small population very rapidly, where it's extremely difficult for it to spread into a large population. So the tininess of, of the number of our human ancestors allowed a rather rapid evolution away from uh, the other groups, who are also evolving, of course, because they're also in small groups. And um, that at, at this split, you start going down this pathway, and it's shown here as a single line, but as all of you know from the newspaper, there are many, many species splitting off at different times with different characteristics, all in the, the humanoid, the hominid line. And, but by chance, all of those other species uh, went extinct except one. And that's another characteristic. If you're a small group, then it's very easy to go extinct. And for all of the other, we know, I don't know, 20, 30 other hominid uh, species, and all went extinct except one. The genus Homo, which is the group of species in which we sit, originates about two and a half million years ago, and they start calling skeletons uh, Homo sapiens about a half a million years ago. But even though they're Homo sapiens, their brains are, are at that time significantly smaller than ours are now. And on an anatomically modern humans date only from about 100 to 150,000 uh, years ago. And all during this period, the number of humans was clearly very small. And so it's very humbling to, to realize that with a small group that's evolving rapidly, which means it's not yet mastered its environment, because you don't, once you you're, uh, have optimized your relationship to your environment, uh, evolution slows down. But if, if we're evolving rapidly, that means we haven't yet mastered it. So a small group uh, struggling in its environment very likely to go extinct. Most of our sibling species went extinct. And I think with a very small roll of the dice differently, the line toward humans could easily have gone extinct. It seems uh, that about 100,000 years ago, there was a bottleneck uh, in the growth of, the, of human species. And the humans living at that time, a small group, were the ancestors to all current uh, human beings. There was a small population of about two to 10,000, they believe. That was the total human population at the time. Two to 10,000 of humans uh, living in Africa and interbreeding. There may have been other human populations somewhere else that, that, that disappeared, we, we don't know. And the numbers two to 10,000, some research puts them a, f a few times higher. We don't really know. Uh, but again, very small number. We know from that period that there was substan no substantial population growth, so that means the average number of surviving children was, was two, or maybe eensy weensy a bit higher than two. So that meant when you have, on average, two children uh, per couple, that means that most lineages have died out, that most individuals who are living at that time, of this small number, le now leave no descendants at all. And if you trace back, the genetics suggests that all of current humans, all races all over the world, are the descendants of a single human female. That every other line from the time when she was alive has died out. And similarly, uh, for males, we are the, all the descendants of a single human male. All other lines ha have died out. And those two didn't have to live at the same time. <laughs> In fact, almost certainly did not live at the same time. It's just the randomness of lines dying out. And the genetics tells us that we know the rate at which DNA chain mutates and diverges. And, so we, and we know the range of variation in current humans. So we just sort of narrowed that back. And it goes back to <coughs> this, what did I say, 100,000 years ago. So that's <coughs> the, the, the genetic Eve and the genetic Adam that the newspapers just, just love this story. But it's you know, it's just a common result of at a slowly a population that doesn't have a lot of surviving children, lines are gonna die out. You can read that the royal houses of Europe is where you're all exposed to it. Look how few generations the royal houses last before they don't have any heirs. And that's in modern, these are the richest people at their time and have all the food and protection, everything that they want. And they can't stay going for more than a few generations. And so in primitive times, the rate of extinction of, of lines was was great. 
So about 50,000 years ago, so we were spent a few million years in Africa, then about 50,000 years ago, uh, a group uh, of humans migrated out of Africa. And again, the numbers and the time, some people say it was as late as 25,000 years ago that they migrated out. But then amazing things happen. Once they burst out on the rest of the world, they spread everywhere. Humans are found everywhere on the Eurasian continent. That's from Siberia to Spain um, uh, by about 20,000 years ago. And then from Siberia, they crossed the Bering uh, uh, Strait, which was a land bridge at that time, and expanded into the Americas and reached the very tip of South America by 10,000 uh, years ago. <coughs> so in 40,000 years, uh, which is a blink of an eye in evolutionary terms, humans spread everywhere on Earth an incredible population explosion. This is the first and greatest explosion of uh, population explosions of humans. And you should note that something was making us superior at, at that time. And it clearly has nothing to do with modern technology. This, all of this fantastic expansion even predates the invention of agriculture and most of what we consider civilization uh, s starts with, with agriculture. So what is the main difference that al has allowed this story that humans have, have done this and chimps have, have done this? And will you ask, what is the reproductive rate of chimpanzees? Well, I've told you that a chimp mother has one young every five to eight years. So at that rate, it's going to be very hard to increase at any, any great speed. But human females have babies much more frequently uh, it's quite possible to have a baby every year or every year and a half uh, or two years. <coughs> and uh, this is common. My, my brother was born 20 months apart from me. How many of you have siblings less than two years apart? Yeah, most of you. So humans are quite capable of doing something that chimps just cannot do. Uh, they have a rate of reproduction about four or five times slower than we do, the mothers, the chimp mothers, cannot take care of more than one young at a time. They will have a young that's clinging to them, and then perhaps an adolescent uh, son or daughter with them. But they'll never, you'll never see two infants at a time. Whereas <coughs> humans can easily take care of two infants at a time. What? Twins. Twins in chimps. Uh, I have never s heard, read anything about chimps occurring in, in, in uh, twins occurring in chimps. And I don't know whether uh, they ever do. I, I, it may be just that we don't have a, enough observation that maybe occasionally chim twins do happen. But it's not, not been reported that I've seen. Anybody take a Oh, it's not about chimps. I was just going to ask if that's regulated by hormones completely. Like, like F you had said that um, lactation stops. Yes. Uh, they're nursing them for a long time. I don't recall what the, what the number is, but there's many behavioral mechanisms. So in nursing, the actual physical stimulation of the nipple releases hormones oxytocin, which prevents ovulation again. And that can be prolonged for quite a period of time, but it's not absolute. So there are other behavioral uh, mechanisms, other internal hormonal mechanisms, which ensure this. And <coughs> in chimpanzees, we very hard to capture a chimp and do the physiology and experiment. So we basically probably don't know most of the answer to, the, to that, that question. Okay, so the, a major difference in the rep in between humans and chimps is a tremendous increase in human fecundity. Now in, in demography we use the word fecundity means uh, the ability to have children. Fertility means the number of children you actually have. In common, and that comes from French usage. The French use the word sort of oppositely to the way we do, and demography was born in France. So when I say fertility, I don't mean the ability to have children. That's fecundity. But I mean the number of children that any given set of women actually have. So we have to ask ourselves, uh, what evolutionary factors uh, allowed this change in fecundity? And so what limited... Uh, uh, chimp population expanded. What limited chimp fecundity? Well, in primate evolution, the main fa factor is the time that brain development takes. 
A body that's capable of walking and chewing and so forth can develop rather rapidly in all kinds of animals. Uh, develop on a very short time scale and are immediately capable of doing those things. But if you're going to have a species with a big brain, that's a slow process. And so in, in all, the, all the, the higher brain, the bigger brain primates, the slow thing is, is brain development. And in order to not have to carry this baby like for till the brain is mature at, at like age 13 or something, they say we don't really progress beyond adolescence. <laughs> uh, so in humans and, and great apes, the baby is, is born with physically somewhat mature, but the brain is still growing enormously. So really this postnatal fetal development uh, of the brain. So even at the nine months of pregnancy, we're not at the end uh, of the period of, of brain development. The brain is nowhere near its final size <coughs> or complexity. Um, so uh, that limits the, uh, the rate at which one can have childbirth. And because the, the infant is born in chimps and in humans is born uh, incapable of taking care of itself, the mother has to stay with the child and, and, and take care of it. And in chimps, the mother stays exclusively with her infant for several years. Um, and the chimps get very little, as I mentioned, very little in the way of resources uh, from the males. They mostly, you watch them, they, do, they don't come in contact with males all that much. They, they and their young forage by themselves, and et cetera, et cetera. And the males are just patrolling. They see them every so often, and the males protect uh, the boundaries. But in terms of taking care of the young, the males basically have no role whatsoever. As a result of this need to have intense uh, care of the young and no help from anyone, sometimes other females will help, but basically no help at all, the period in which the mother has to devote herself exclusively to that one young is quite prolonged. Now in humans, males do play some more intimate part uh, in child rearing, not anywhere near as much as, as a female, but they do bring resources. In general, in most human societies over time, males are responsible for bringing some resources to the female on a rather continuing basis. And we don't really know how this evolved, because these things, you can't really tell these things from fossils. Um, but what we know is that Africa, the chimps started in the jungle, and then Africa started drying out, and so some subset of the chimps, maybe pushed out by stronger individuals or clever individuals, were pushed into this drying out more grasslands, where there was uh, less cover and less fruiting trees. Dry land doesn't produce the big fruiting trees that chimps uh, depend on. So as the difference between chimps and bonobos, when there's a lesser food density, the population has to spread out. That if an individual is going to find any food, they're not going to find enough for a large group. So individual females would have to go forage uh, quite separately. And you can speculate further that as the females spread out, the dominant males could no longer keep watch over and control over these females. They were just too far uh, spread geographically. And so while in, in chimps, uh, while a male and a female may go off for a short time uh, period uh, in, in what's called a consortship, and there may be matings uh, at that time, there's no lasting, no, no continuing uh, relationship between any particular male and a female. Uh, the chimpanzees, as I mentioned, are male bonded, and they spend more time with each other, male to male, than the males do uh, with the females. In humans, of course, we still have a lot of m what they call male-male bonding, military units, sports teams, all-male clubs, football, wedding parties, all, watch, football watching parties, etc. But uh, we've evolved in the direction of much more male-female uh, interaction and, and context. Female sexuality uh, changed. Uh, while chimpanzees always mate from behind, human humans engage in frontal copulation. And since the face is how humans and also chimpanzees uh, detect each other, they know individuals largely by the, their facial structure, and they detect emotions, it's a very important part of communication, detect the emotions and respond to each other by, by facial cues. So 
this face-to-face -face interaction, especially in the inten intensity of a sexual encounter, is considered a, a large part of the evolution of male-female bonding. And as I forgot to show you last time, but this is an excuse to show you this time, here is uh, a, 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 a bon bonobo uh, engaging in front-to-front in -front sex, male and female here, and she's grinning. She's clearly uh, being pretty happy about this. And I also said I would show you this is two females uh, doing uh, the same thing. If, you didn't, if I didn't tell you it was, this was two females, you wouldn't know the difference. Unless you're watching, you can see that they both have their, their swellings on. That's how you tell that, that they're two females. I mean, the guys take the picture, obviously, knew a lot more, but uh, you can tell it. So this is uh, what I described <coughs> that the locals call it hoka hoka. And uh, so this whole uh, evolution of sexuality um, in uh, the human line, the clitoris has moved forward uh, for which in face-to-face -face copulation probably makes it uh, more female pleasure during uh, the act of copulation and therefore, again, reinforces <coughs> this bonding. So another big difference is, as, uh, this is a not an extreme case of, of, uh, of, of the rump. Um, that's another, another topic. Um, that humans do not advertise their estrus. Not only do we not, remember the, the, the chimps advertise their estrus in order to get the males together and have the males compete for them. Humans keep it secret. Not only don't the males know when a, when a female is in estrus, uh, but the female herself does not know when she's in estrus. And for a very long time it was believed that females are fertile during their periods. It was only in the 1930s that it was found out by a Japanese group that females are fertile in the mid-period between their periods. And even further, it was believed in the 1930s that females are fertile a few days before and a few days after the middle uh, of, of uh, ovulation, the middle of the period. And in fact, we now f know just from about 10 years ago that the actual fertile period always is only precedes ovulation that intercourse must take place before ovulation. So not only <coughs> do, we, do human females not advertise to the females, they don't know, and scientists with all our invasion have just now finally figured out, we think, uh, when a human female uh, is fertile. So this is a big, big, big change. It's such a big part, the advertising is such a big part of uh, primate sexuality. Uh, why has it disappeared in humans? Um, so uh, it may be sort of the reverse, that if females are out there alone, and there's carnivores, you'll read about this from the Aceh, that are you know, lions and tigers out there ready to eat them, and they need protection of various sorts and maybe help in, in, in finding food. So it's important to have a male hanging around. And a male, evolutionary purpose, he wants to inseminate the female. So if he knows when a female's having estrus, he has to be there then to inseminate her. But if he knows when she is in estrus, he also knows when she is not in estrus. And when she's not in estrus, he may have no evolutionary push to stay there, but go out and try to find uh, some other female. So the purpose of not showing your estrus may be to keep the male uncertain of when you're fertile, and therefore he has to attend to the female all the time. And once he's there, he might as well help her because that will ensure <coughs> that whatever infants come along are, are in good shape. So uh, if that's correct, that, and certainly males and females started spending more time together and they're more dispersed, that reduces male-male uh, competition. Remember, the male-male competition is a result of a group in which a lot of males stay together. When you're more dispersed, male-male competition uh, has to be reduced. And so it looks like the, in, in the evolution to humans, that's what switching is from the advertising, which allows the males to compete and the female gets the male with the best genes, she's switching to wanting resources from the male. She's no longer interested so much in male competition, but in whatever resources the male can bring to her by having a male around uh, continually. This story is rather complicated and, and very controversial. There's a very nice reading uh, in your packet. 
might be interesting to, oh boy, to consider that uh, how does the male respond uh, to this change in strategy? Um, if, if the road to monogamy starts going down, then paternity becomes more certain. That in, a, in the chimps, where a female is copulating with everyone, uh, there's no reason to be certain of paternity uh, at all. But once it becomes clear that, yes, this child is, is almost certainly mine, then it becomes evolutionary advantageous for the male to start putting resources into this mother and child, because that ensures their survival. And things start developing in a different direction, where stable pairing becomes evolutionarily advantage. The male putting resources into the, into the pair uh, is for evolutionary advantage. So it's, it seems pretty clear that an increase in the male contribution to child rearing is one of the major reasons uh, for the increased fertility of humans, why humans are able to out-reproduce uh, chimpanzees. <coughs> Of course, as, as you all uh, are aware, uh, monogamy has not by any means uh, taken human societies totally over. And some societies uh, overtly uh, sanction poly polygamy. But even in our culture, which Europe and North America, genetic testing shows that 10 to 15% of humans do not have the father that they're supposed to have. That father is usually defined as the resident male, is not the father. And that's uh, quite a large percentage. American women uh, report six different sexual partners' lifetime, uh, and males report 16 female partners' lifetime. Now, one thing we know, if you're at all mathematical, that the, since it two, takes two to tango, the average has to be the same. <laughs> so it can't be both six and, and 16, and uh, who knows, possibly somewhere in between is correct. But probably higher, because these things tend to be underreported. No one wants to really say how, well, females certainly don't want to say how promiscuous they are usually. And also this old data. Uh, this is uh, from 2001. And with the change of sexual mores in the Western countries, I, I'm sure the numbers are <laughs> exponentially uh, increasing. Uh, so what's another thing about this thing with respect to human evolution is that <coughs> when you're a chimpanzee, the male, the main form of competition is male-male fighting, male-male status jockeying, which takes a certain amount of intelligence to arrange coalitions and so forth. But basically, evolution is pushing you to be uh, big and violent. Now, the individual is dispersed, the male stays with the female, the male starts bringing resource, violence is decreased. The importance of that in the male evolution <laughs> decreases. And the importance of being able to provide resources becomes evolutionarily important. So the kind of intelligence required to find food in a scarce environment, to find shelter, to protect from animals and so forth, becomes important. So a fair reason for the increase in human uh, mental capacity might also be this shift from a dependence on violence for competition to a, 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 a dependence on resource acquisition of resources for competition and for evolution. So okay, um, I've run out of time, and so we will continue uh, with humans and how they are different from chimps next time.